haven't been here, but I had a suspicion it would be like a like an intimate setting, and uh, it's even worse than I thought. Like I can see all of you, which means you can see me. Um, I can't pretend that you can't see me, and I have to read out loud, which I would rather be poisoned than read out loud, but I would rather have a career than be poisoned, so it's fine, it's just like not human. <laughs> you might as well come and sit on the edge of my bed, like come into my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> that said, I'm so, so happy to be here, and I'd like to thank God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. I mean, it's funny in New York, because intimate means small, and intimate really means unpopular. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, it's not intimate because you're so into it. It's, in it's intimate because, like, there's not that many of you, I think. Uh, and, you know, that's fine. Uh, that's why I can see you all, which is great. You look great. Um, despite my best efforts to stare into, like, some middle distance, it doesn't seem to exist. I can't find the middle difference. That's a metaphor, no big deal. I fucking hate writing. <laughs> I came to this conclusion, incidentally, after writing a number of... Well, not writing, but like agreeing to write, there's a difference, you'll find it. <laughs> a number of pieces for a number of various art books. Uh, you know, no big deal. Art books are just really elaborate metaphors for actual books. No one reads art books, like, uh, you know, the same way that no one actually likes metaphors. Um, this one art book is about soft art uh, to be published in the fall by Rizzoli. Rizzoli. And in the winter that's over now, I hope, an editor recently emailed me to ask if I would write something, an essay, presumably, on the subject of intimacy. So I did what I always do. I said yes, and then I hoped I'd get hit by a car. <laughs> it's not an impossible dream, Roland Barthes, at the age of 64, walking home from some lunch party, was struck and killed by a laundry man. Imagine having to do all that laundry all over again. The irony, the fateful impossibility of ever really getting out of bloodstain. Roland Barthes believed that the automobile was, halfway through the 20th century, the almost exact equivalent of great Gothic cathedrals. He met, he said, quote, the supreme creation of the era, conceived with passion by unknown artists, and consumed in image, if not in usage, by a whole population which appropriates them as a purely magical object, end quote. He was writing about the new Citroën, and he said of this car, we must not forget that an object is the best messenger of a world above that of nature. One can easily see in an object, at once a perfection and an absence of origin, a closure and a brilliance, a transformation of life into matter. Roland Barthes loved cars, certain cars. It is fair to say he did not love laundry vans, most laundry vans, but with this one particular laundry van, on the evening of March 26, 1980, he became intimate. The laundry van flattened and interpolated him in a single moment of recognition, remixed to cognition, life immediately dimming and switching to matter. His is what we call a perfect accident or at least that's what I call it, you can call it whatever you like when it's your turn to read. In the Georgia <laughs> Review, in the summer of 1981, J. Gerald Kennedy, whose name I include only because it's so great, he is a Kennedy, I wonder if he knows Eileen Miles, wrote a piece <laughs> on Roland Barthes, his authorship, his death, and his first unfinished novel, a novel, the most fateful of all impossibilities, I mean as far as writing goes, which admittedly isn't very far. Here's Kennedy. An unpredictable figure, Barthes entered a new phase with The Pleasure of the Text, which I insert was published in 1973, seven years before The Night with the Laundry Room. After social mythology, semiology, and textuality, all more or less empirical phenomena, he turned to the problem of morality, I'm still quoting Kennedy from this journal, how the subject functions within a realm of available choices. The actual subject of this phase, however, proved to be Barthes himself as a connoisseur of earthly delights, and we note a perceptible change of focus from objective sign systems to obsessions and fantasies, which prefigures the announced but unfulfilled ambition of his final years to create a work of fiction. Let's talk about this announcement, which I love. Barthes, who had long been the structuralist bogeyman in France, a country of arts and letters, of fallacious biographies, and an of extremely whack belief in its own prowess, decided to <laughs> never again mind what he said about literature, most of which isn't repeatable, which I think is how he intended it anyway, and say, I'm going to write my own autobiographical fallacy, which is to say, a novel. That's what I say, he said, more precisely, here is Kennedy. 
Saddened by a sense of failure, bards express the desire to escape from the prison house of critical meta-language and through simpler, more compassionate language to close the gap between private experience and public discourse. In other words, bards is doing two things. One, you know, predicting his own death as an author. It's very eerie when you think about it. It's like one of those conspiracy theories involving like, um, you know, like a band and the death of Princess Diana. I can't remember which one. The other thing that Bards was trying to do is Bards was trying to go pop. Not pop as in psychology, not pop as in art, not, but pop as in music. Pop as in specifically R&B music. Music that is, let's look back, about obsessions and fantasies. Music that wants to take your clothes off. The best pop star alive, and the one who made it so I can say that R&B pop is pop at all, is Mariah Carey. When people write professionally about musicians as femme and pop and car-like and magical as Mariah Carey, they write less of her achievements than of her measurements. Her staggering five-octave range, her 14 top 10 albums, her insane number of number one singles, 18 and counting, but so on. Uh, I'm not here to count. I'm here tonight to talk about Memoirs of an Imperfect Angel, Mariah Carey's novel-length album, which is the thing I listen to while I try and try to write about intimacy. Don't you love when these writers, professional writers, get really, really into words, like looking up etymology and shit? The root of X word is the Latin Y, which is to say exactly what it sounds like the root is to anyone who has ever read Latin or looked at an English dictionary. But here's a joke. I'm going to be different. I'm picking up handfuls of the soil that the word intimacy grows in because although the root is intimus, which, duh, the soil in which intimacy is buried in is, well, I should really say interred instead of buried because it's inter, I-N-T-E-R, uh, inter, with which intimacy shares its most interesting meanings. <laughs> inter gives us interior and interiority. Inter gives us inner sanctums, back rooms, solitary confinement, confinement in general, and graves. Inter gives us the scoop. Isn't it sick? Give us the scoop. Scoop. I always think of eyeballs on a platter because intimacy is seeing. Love is looking. When I'm in love, all I do is look. All I do is look at Jesse, my husband, for example, the exemplar of the example. But seeing. I was seeing this guy, and though I didn't want to believe it, he was seeing me. But I digress. <laughs> it's a wrap! It's the 11th song in Memoirs of an Imperfect Angel, which was produced by Terry Nash and Christopher Stewart, aka The Dream and The Other Guy. And It's a Wrap is the song at which, coming as it does after a song called Standing O that leaves you firmly in your seat, you just know the album is a failure. Made by geniuses, it's indulgent, it's meandering, low-key, overlong, both overproduced and unedited. A lot of shimmer and very little shine. Mariah was either 40 years old or almost 40 years old when it came out. Even the encyclopedia doesn't know for sure when she was born, which is, of course, the true mark of an American diva. <laughs> that and all the number one singles. Mariah was and is and will ever be famous for diva -ness. Uh, but on, but in Memoirs of an Imperfect Angel, her voice takes to the wings and her uncertain personality tries to stake out ground on center stage instead. She's hushed now. She is almost as mumbling as she is melismatic, and her range is more emotional than vocal. She's teasing, beefing, crying, wilding, cracking us up, and maybe she's cracking up herself. Well, Mariah's crack-ups are another thing for me not to count. <laughs> On It's a Wrap, she literally talks to herself, telling her to let this guy go, and telling us, for our part, to let her just breathe for a second. Yes, her voice is tireless, but she isn't, and if I ever misrepresented my self-image, she sings in a whisper, then I'm sorry. Do you love Mariah? <laughs> I love Mariah. I'm assuming you love Mariah, but you never know zombies walk among us. <laughs> Mariah Carey is the greatest of Americans, okay? She is beautiful and funny, and one day when Elizabeth Wurzel is president, Elizabeth Wurzel is obsessed with the Constitution. Did you know she has a new book out? Anyway, it's about the Constitution, so when Elizabeth Wurzel is president and men are not allowed to write about popular music, which is something that Elizabeth Wurzel said once, and which I believe as an American citizen, on that day, we will stop saying Mariah Carey's unintentional
intentionally hilarious because uh, Mariah Carey is a masterwork of fucking intention. She is not only beautiful and funny and a total lush, but also a goddamn dame, and she is not quote unquote just a singer, but also a songwriter and a composer, and on its rap, her writing hand is visibly shaky. <laughs> Her lyrics are show-offy and too syllabic, like she rhymes acquiescent with lesson, are you okay? <laughs> and sometimes, yeah, the lyrics are daft. Or they sound like they're daft, like if I ever misrepresented my self-image, for one thing, that sounds like a total redundancy. Isn't self-image already a misrepresentation? That's how we are trained by professors who ain't no barts to read fiction and to read music and especially to read pop music as a spectacular, top-heavy production in which the star, by the time we see her, has been deader than the author for however many light years it takes. But not Mariah Carey. Mariah Carey lives in memoirs of an imperfect angel. And most on anti-hit low jams, like it's a rap, Mariah Carey is letting us see her like this. Her mascara runs, her nails break, her nails are a metaphor for her heart. As for her voice, it's a shadow of its spotlit self. The 2009 New York Times review of the album began by asking us when Mariah Carey stopped singing. The fuck Mariah Carey's shadow could drink Ariana Grande for breakfast. <laughs> the next paragraph, however, unwittingly, yes, unintentionally, gives us a good answer. Of late, Mariah Carey has been whispering as if newly scared of grand gestures. To which I say, you'd be scared or scarred too if you had started in 2001's Glitter. <laughs> as if newly scared of grand gestures? No shit, speaking of numbers. 9, 11 happened 10 days before the cinematic release of the profoundly uncinematic Glitter. I say happened, you know, but in most of white America, 9-11 is still happening. 9-11 will always be happening to say nothing of the schedule of beheadings. Aren't we all fucking scared of grand gestures? And speaking of efforts not made, I was seeing this guy. It was winter, spring, it's hard to talk about this because I already wrote about it, so I thought it was over. <laughs> Only the finished artwork is privy to its earlier lives. If a beautiful object, say, makes us cry, and I should say, personally, beautiful objects are always making me cry. It is because sadness is the accurate response, and not because <laughs> tears mean anything, although they can. Beauty is the concealment of death, and a successful object repudiates the formlessness after. A beautiful object is full of ashes. And I wrote a beautiful essay about him, an essay I still get emails and anonymous questions about, an essay he never read, an essay I wrote because I knew he would never read it, and an essay that I read out loud to him in the middle of a fucking sunrise. In Miami, when I should have been in my hotel room looking at soft art, writing about intimacy, writing and reading without being seen. You know the Dorothy Parker thing about writing? People love this Dorothy Parker thing about writing. Uh, it's like, um... I hate writing, I love having written. But when I say I fucking hate writing, I mean that I hate being a writer. I'd rather be a painter or something glamorous, okay? I also mean that I hate how hard it is to write, but once I'm writing, like actually writing, not talking, not typing, writing, then I'm so alive I can't stand it. I love writing, I hate having written. I resent spending life in the knowledge that I've already said too much. So I said, I've already said too much to him. I said it to him. <laughs> you know, I had taken apart the object I had made. I had killed the messenger, Bart would say, maybe, you know, if he had not been struck by a laundry van and had lived to, a, you know, an unreasonably lengthy age. I said, you have to say something now. Many great artworks go unfinished because their secrets are too painful or exquisite and their authors would literally rather die. When I interviewed the artist Annika Yi like a year ago, she talked about divorce, a theme in her recent work, as a kind of sublime failure. I asked if she'd ever been married, and she looked at me like I was an idiot. <laughs> like, why would I be married? I am a conceptual thinker. <laughs> well, I, Annika, am currently training to be an expert in long, durational work because I, like I said, am married. <laughs> and being married, I am like a person who has spent her entire life being in relationships that might become marriage at any time with very little warning. And so I think I know what divorce is. And divorce isn't like, this isn't working out. Divorce is the private, terrible knowledge that one of you, or both of you, can do the work but won't do the work anymore. And you would rather cut this baby in half than let either of you keep it. 
Because with the destruction of the marriage object comes also the obliteration of any self-contained secrets to a long-lasting marriage. Every marriage, no matter how long it lasts, is built around a secret, and divorce says it's too hard to keep. So, what if you feel divorced in the sense of, like, you were in this relationship and somehow it wasn't a relationship, it wasn't anything that might become marriage, it was a relationship that knew from the start what most relationships are made to figure out, i.e., whether or not we can be married. We can't, is the answer to that. Oh, and I don't mean, like, legally married or whatever, I mean together for a long time. I mean together, together, you know, publicly, socially, and emotionally together. We were only emotional together. We had cool surfaces and underneath a lot of animal shit. This guy and I had the intimacy of people trapped in an elevator for three complete months. A thing we said was not going anywhere. I can never, ever, ever forget, I can never forget how he smelled and I didn't even like it. It wasn't a mistake like most of my relationships are. A mistake is not knowing or not knowing how. A mistake is made by not thinking. Mistakes are congenitally not meant to hurt you. A mistake is just doing it wrong, but we did everything exactly like we said that we wanted it, and we did everything secret. A failure is knowing, secretly, exactly what to do and how to do it. And then a failure is knowing not to do it. Roland Barthes, knowing how to write a novel, all those preparations. Mariah Carey, knowing how to write a hit, memoirs of an imperfect angel, all those songs and only one true hit, obsession. To fail is not, it can never have been the plan. That's quitting. Failure is the knowledge of enough. This guy that I loved once, once, did for me. A series of magic tricks with cards. We had slept together less than a handful of times and the cards came down out of nowhere. I wasn't prepared. I still think that I couldn't have been prepared. He was so good at so many things that the magic was cruel, and I remember being speechless. Not figuratively speechless, but physically drained of words. Transfiguratively fucking speechless. It was over right there. I just kept thinking, it's over, it's over. I knew, and because if I didn't talk, he didn't talk, we sat there in a silence that usually takes people years. A silence that is always called, you know, you know what it's called, in the flamethrowers. Rachel Kirshner writes, isn't that what intimacy so often is? Supposing you understand, conveying that you do, because you feel in theory that you could? In her new song, Reality, with its alternative spelling of reality, Grimes, singing like Mimi on memoir sometimes, says, we were scared and you were beautiful, she says, and when I peer over the edge and see death, it's as if we're always the same. She wrote the song on tour two years ago and released it the other day, saying essentially that it was a barely salvaged demo. Reality belonged to a concept, an album she had scrapped. Reality is an almost perfect song. Some people don't understand how a quote-unquote failure can also be an almost perfect song, but I can't think of any other kind. A failed artwork is dangerous because a failed artwork answers the insincere question, how does she do it? It becomes a lesson in objecthood rather than an object itself, a lecture where an experience is wanted. There is nothing more intimate than a failure is what I've been trying to say without telling you, but forget it, now I have bigger things to think about, like how to not tell you his name. I wish I could say his name, but then this would be like a feminist performance art, and I guess that I'm not in the mood. <laughs> the essence of an object, wrote Roland Barthes in an essay on my all-time favorite visual artist, Cy Twombly has something to do with the way it turns into trash. It's not necessarily what remains after the object has been used. It's rather what is thrown away in use. And so it is with Twombly's writings. By writings here, Bards means uh, Twombly's failed articulations of uh, scribbles and loops, often compounded by also failed erasures, uh, and these make up his compositions. And so it is with Twombly's writings. They are the fragments of an indolence and this makes them extremely elegant. It's as though the only thing left after the strongly erotic act of writing were the languid fatigue of love, a garment cast aside into a corner of the page." And, and here I am in my bedroom, picking through the clothes on my floor. Love, alcohol, clothes on the floor. That's Elizabeth Hardwick, whose 1979 novel, Sleepless Nights, is a million times better and more imperfect than Roland Barthes's would have been. I mean, no offense, but it is. And since I'm digressing, can I just take a moment to not say sorry for mispronouncing Barthes the whole time? It's not like European philosophers pronounce our names correctly. Get over it. Do you think? 
Nietzsche, what is Nietzsche, German? But every time out of his native dialect to pronounce Sarah correctly, no, he'd be like, Zaha, that is my opium. <laughs> I so wish I had some kind of opiate, but I can't treat failure with refusal. I mean, I can. Uh, I am, for instance, pretty sure I'm never having kids or even getting pregnant again, but life isn't one big abortion, and I don't need the pills, I'm just going to have another drink. We were in Miami, and I was supposed to be writing about intimacy, and I wasn't supposed to see him like that again, and he wasn't supposed to see me, and I wasn't supposed to remember that he made me feel like writing feels, not talking, texting, writing. We were in Miami, and the working class, country style, R&B anthem, Tuesday was playing everywhere, always, or maybe it was only in my head, a head full of bodies, and it's another song like the Grime song that is technically a demo. I mean, the singing sounds not like a club on a Tuesday, it's Tuesday. <laughs> but an empty <laughs> bar on a Tuesday, it sounds like singing in the shower with a bottle of wine, not like I do that all the time, and it sounds more like anything, more like, more like everything, like the mood I've been in since I realized that I can't sublimate failure, and that I don't stop loving, that turning all the matter into material doesn't make it any less matter. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't matter at all. I've already said too much. I should go home and write. Uh, I'm sorry. The last lecture Bart's ever gave on February 23rd, 1980 was a summation of two years spent teaching the preparation of the novel, the novel meaning like his novel, and in his notes he wrote something and then crossed that something out. He wrote, will I succeed one day? It's not even obvious to me today when I pen these lines. And in his typewriter, one month and three days later, he left an essay. One always feels to speak of what one loves. One always fails. I kind of said it like feels, which is a whole other section. But, you know, I'm not finished, but I'm going to stop. So here, as McConan might sing if you were me, I don't think that I should write. I'm just going to have another drink. Good night.